Can you hear me, Mr. Bipendra? Can you hear me? Mr. Yes, uh, yes, welcome, uh, Dr. Singhvi, uh, to the event. Uh, I can I hear you clearly. I will mute. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you also perfectly. We'll just start and start uh, right away. I'll, uh, I will mute I'll myself. See. You tell me when we are ready, then we'll start. Absolutely, sir. We'll do that. Okay, I think uh, we, we should now start the event. Uh, we are already uh, at 6 p.m. as we had uh, announced. And our uh, chief guest is also here. So I think it is time we should start. You have so, other participants? Otherwise, we can yes. wait for three minutes. You've got your other registrants. I, I have uh, other speakers. I think so the registrants just... and the participants, the other listeners. Yes. We have all of them here. All the speakers are here. So I think we should start. The participants will uh, join. Okay, sir. So let me start the event. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, webinar on uh, comprehensive rethink on India's China pol policy, law and society alliance, and defense capital. Uh, let me first introduce the host of the day so that uh, we get along uh, the event uh, accordingly. So Law and Society Alliance uh, is a New Delhi headquartered independent national growth organization and a think and act tank that has worked work and presence of volunteers from all over the country, including cities like Mumbai, Chandigarh, Hyderabad, Bengaluru, and Chennai. Law and Society Alliance provides uh, legal and uh, knowledge intervention on national issues that need study, research, analysis and prolonged groundwork, matters such as national security, human rights, terrorism, narcotics, narcotics trade, and its links to terrorism, uh, legal reforms, legislative reforms, financial inclusion, and all such issues, all activities, as aspects of human activity, uh, and India's development. That is the uh, aim of uh, Law and Society Alliance. We also bring together uh, you know, uh, experienced advocates, journalists, businessmen, business houses, chartered accountants, uh, trade and commerce experts, government officials, former bureaucrats, uh, retired police and armed forces officers and all together on, at a, on a single table to discuss issues and find solutions for problems that India faces and to ensure that uh, there is some uh, growth in the Indian uh, economy and uh, other aspects of it. Is a national uh, defense and uh, strategic affairs magazine which is published from Delhi. I'm the editor of the magazine and I'm also the chairman of the Law and Society Alliance. And my name is N.C. Bipindra. Just to introduce myself, I'm a journalist and an advocate. So, uh, welcome all of you to this uh, event. Uh, just to introduce the subject of the day so that uh, I get on to the speakers uh, and the chief guest of the day. Uh, the uh, the subject, as I had mentioned earlier, is comprehensive rethink on India's China policy. Uh, just to introduce the subject, uh, though, I mean, it's nearly three months now since uh, there is a conflict that is happening in the Ladakh border between India and China. And this has led to experts in, in the fields of strategic affairs and national security to call 2020, the year 2020, as the inflection point in Sino-Indian relationship. Since 1947, when Communist China was born, uh, 1949, when Communist China was born, India has only extended a hand of friendship to our northern neighbor. When Tibet was annexed by the Communist China, India did not object. When East Turkestan was annexed by Communist China, India still did not object. What Communist China had effectively done was to change its boundaries and established, establish uh, new, new ones in South, West and North through a series of annexations. Rather, India thought its concessions to Communist China would help in fostering one of the strongest bilateral relationship uh, in the world and also in Asia. 
then happened the 1962 war and the relationship between the two nations took a news dive it took another 25 years before the relationship could uh, witness a thaw in 1988 since then there has been five bilateral border security related agreements beginning with the one in 1993 bilateral trade too has grown and it is now tilted heavily with communist china having a greater share of the pie there is one argument that says that denying that larger share of the pie would hurt china communist china where it pains the most despite several diplomatic concessions over the years including a seat as the permanent member of the union united nations security council in the early 1950s communist china never took the friendly hand that was extended by india india has got no concession from communist china and india does not need any one anymore is what the thought process that is happening and this is the overwhelming sentiment in india as of today so this sentiment is also borne out uh, by the anger at the betrayal by the communist china at every stage in this bilateral relationship over the all these 70 years is this time for a comprehensive rethink and a reset in india's china policy should india reject the one china policy that it has never as it has never considered as beijing has never considered one india principle and has gone ahead with projects like the china pakistan economic corridor or cpec in indian territories that are currently under illegal occupation so these are the subjects that we are going to be discussing and uh, as we all know honorable dr abhishek singhvi has argued that there should be a rethink in india's china policy so he is the chief guest of the day i'll be introducing him in detail uh, very shortly we also have other speakers uh, today uh, we have, have ninong ering who is a member of the legislative assembly uh, in arunachal pradesh and also a former union minister uh, we also have uh, ilchat kokbore who is the uh, director of uh, china, you know china affairs department uh, in the uh, vigur uh, world congress he is also here i'll be introducing all of them in detail we also have dr uh, avinash godbole from op jindal global uh, st uh, from sonipat so uh, let me first uh, you know take this opportunity and i have this great honor in uh, introducing uh, dr abhishek vi honorable uh, singhvi is a senior three time sitting member of parliament he is a former chairman parliament parliamentary standing committee on law and justice he was india's youngest designated senior advocate at 34 and india's youngest appointed additional solicitor general at the age of 37 in 1997 he is a author and columnist and a visible media personality he is also the senior most serving national spokesperson of the congress party his columns have appeared in india's two top english dailies and have been published and have been published as two books titled candid corner and straight talk both with with four words written by former prime minister dr manmohan singh he is also an occasional columnist in major hindi dailies dainik baskar and rajasthan patrika uh the global leader for tomorrow award by economic forum at davos in 1999 dr singhvi has been the opening lead speaker for the treasury congress branches in parliament for almost every major debate from 2006 to 2013 he has been the common factor in almost all landmark supreme court cases spanning constitutional law law corporate law and arbitration and several other subjects he supports many charities including the priya center for destitute children and the singhvi scholarship at college cambridge this is apart from the sterling work done by him over 12 years in rajasthan from his mp lads funds supporting 400 projects in the field of health and education i will introduce other speakers as and when their opportunity comes to speak right now i would uh, request uh, dr singhvi to be the chief guest of this event and to chair this session and to make his opening remarks for the day dr singhvi the time is yours uh, uh thank you so much mr bipendra for a very generous and hospitable introduction uh, my dear friends panelists all registrants viewers members of your organization let me start with a confession i am no diplomat my father was temporarily a diplomat and i told him my favorite quote about a diplomat when he was taking charge as india's uh, what was to become longest serving high commissioner uh, that a diplomat is defined as someone who can tell 
a person to go to hell in a manner in which that person starts looking forward to the journey now obviously my expertise in that area as indeed in foreign affairs is very limited but being a lawyer and a spokesperson some degree of persuasive talents like a diplomat have to be exercised and in public life one is supposed to be jack of all so i venture into this hopefully not like the idiom of venturing where uh, angels fear to tread and fools walk freely but how does it matter everybody in a democracy has a view and i think i'm entitled to share my view with you many of whom are experts on this subject friends let me start by two sets of general points the first is that this talk these observations are politics neutral they are ideology neutral they are group neutral the only thing they are not neutral about is india and china this is intended to be a comprehensive wish list and i believe that the nitty gritty of what we can do concretely to recalibrate reinvent rethink reimagine the india china equation is what should uh, take our time and energies this is also as you know because for far too long have we fully or partly wished away reality we have in that sense imagined a different reality than that which exists one of those wishing away or imagining a different reality is our obsession with pakistan the fact that our long term enemy sits right next to us has not fully either dawned or if dawned because it is there in the subconscious has not fully been acted upon we have also not realized that it is somewhere a question of two swords in a scabbard the scabbard being asia ek mayan mein do talwar and sometimes it is necessary to have two swords in a scabbard but then there has to be forced respect and likability between the two and like it or not in real politic in the real world both respect and at least outward likability are consequences of fear now we have certainly got that fear of china either overtly or psychologically or subconsciously for decades but we have not been able to generate a reciprocal fear of india in china in the chinese mind because that alone will generate that respect and at least outward likability which is going to be the solution for a new equilibrium between these two giants that's my first set of general points my second set of general points and i can assure you i don't intend to beat around the bush too long i will come to the nitty gritty of solutions but these points are important even though they may sound a bit general the second set of points is that for this broad recalibration of this equation we need more action and less talk we need fewer lectures like this one and more implementation number 2 the problem is not new and the panaceas are known the question is consistency of application be it for 3 years or 5 years focus of will grit determination thirdly we have to follow as in lot of other things thomas hardy's dictum you take care of the small things the big things will take care of themselves it's something which is remarkably simple and remarkably observed in the absence or in the violation fourthly the fourth general point in my second set of points is that your approach has to be holistic not piecemeal it has to be not partial 
it can't be episodic knee jerk and it has to be both curative and preventive so this holistic is important as i'm going to deal and demonstrate to the extent possible that our strategy to combat china should be comprehensive and balanced it should strike a perfect balance on the economic front on the strategic front on the diplomatic front on the military front on several other fronts and the last two points in the second set of points is that most important is the non measurable non quantifiable uh non statistical element attitudinal change attitudinal change is the most important amongst indians amongst indian government amongst indian stakeholders bureaucrats etc etc because as somebody said aptitude attitude i'm sorry attitude not aptitude determines altitude namely how high you soar in this china india equation and lastly i cannot possibly emphasize the importance of teamwork teamwork includes consensus it includes a broadly agreed momentum direction content all things you have to nobody can ever bridge it completely but you have to largely bridge first recognize and then bridge the de trust deficit you have to reach out and take into confidence even those whom you may politically or otherwise hate you have to not make this a personalized thing it is not about the personal ego or image or standing of any person or institution it is about india in the context of china and you have to not suppress conceal distort and you know that these things can be done by spin by distrust by misrepresentation you have to be a certain degree of candor and frankness including the recognition beat in private not necessarily in public domain of shortcomings and failures because that builds up the trust and also gives you solutions now in case you people are thinking i am beating around the bush for too long let's come to my four or five heads of as nitty gritty a set of solutions i can think of and i would rather like to think of myself as a layman though i am in public life and i do deal with diplomacy and foreign affairs subjects i do deal with law i do deal with the media but at the end of the day for a subject like this i think it's important to have the outsiders uh, or at least the outsider insider view firstly let us look at the military head uh one must remember what li kuan yu said about china i quote he said china is not a, going to become a liberal democracy so don't romanticize china if it did it would collapse you cannot impose on other countries standards which are alien to them and totally disconnected with their past so keep that in mind as a permanent factor secondly i personally don't set much store by the military option except to generate the requisite fear keep the balance keep our forces uh, human non human at the maximum which your economy can afford keep the adversary always under a certain degree of fear and doubt as to the strike capability and therefore maintain the balance i am not thinking of the military option with a giant like china as conquests i am not thinking of that option in the same vein in the same tone as i would think way for example and i have no hesitation naming it pakistan thirdly under the military option i think the tragic part today as we speak is that there was always an lac i mean there is some dispute about it but there was a concept of an lac what has now happened is as we speak and for the last several months that lac has not only been crossed but post withdrawal the areas which were considered our part of the lac have become so called buffer zones i think this is the crux in two simple sentences of what china has gained so the gain is i enter your three rooms 
I vacate two of them and I keep one of your rooms, not myself, but as a buffer zone. That reality, and I don't want to get into details, whether it is partly in Galwan, whether it is partly in Pangso, is something which we will, we should constantly protest against. And I'm now talking, keep the military vigil up. And of course, in the other senses, when I come to diplomatically and otherwise. This crux has to be accepted by the government. It has to be shared in whatever way, degree, content, etc. they want with not only their own departments and ministries, and that is a bit of a tragedy if the government in a false self-image game is not doing that, but also with select segments of the opposition. And the focus of all these stakeholders has to be to restore the status quo ante where these buffer zones are not zones sitting in our land. The Mountain Strike Corps, which I think was an excellent initiative, it was an initiative of the UPA but and made progress, but did not make the full requisite progress during that time. It could have been faster. Has unfortunately suffered a huge decline in the last five years. I think we need to enhance it uh, exponentially. If you like, you can rename it. If you like, you can appropriate, claim its ownership. But for God's sake, do not dilute it or abandon it. It's an excellent scheme, particularly China focused. And it should in fact be expanded right across the northwest to southeast Garland, which is our border with China. I know that with a declining economy, with a COVID pandemic scourge, these are like sledgehammer attacks on already weak defense budgets. But I would still urge our government, and again, as I said, this is not, it's politics neutral largely, to significantly enhance the consistently declining defense budget, which is now somewhere below 1.5% of GDP. And there has been a decline, a secular decline. Now you can juggle with statistics. You can talk about real and price-based, but there, the secular decline has to be controlled and a certain degree of enhancement has to be, this trend has to be reversed. The next point under the military head is that our engagements are interoperability exercises with entities like US must become, of course, increased in frequency, expanded in scope, and more open, more brazen. I don't think we have to be defensive about it. I don't think we have to be uh, kind of shy about it. We are not becoming a vassal state of the US, but the show of strength along with other strong giants is one of the established military practices which we are doing in a small way, but we need to enhance it. We must, and we are doing it already, but to show to China, to snook a nose at China, accelerate the completion of the all-weather Darbuk, Dalat Beg, Oldie Road, the very famous road you know about. We must, in fact, activate and complete a landing uh, ground, what is known as an ALG in the vicinity. And very important is to enhance the somewhat fragile structure and we have, I believe, people from Arunachal Pradesh who are better qualified than me, but I would like to still think of it as a fragile and incoherent infrastructure of Arunachal Pradesh as far as military issues are concerned. So this is my overall wish list. I, as I said, do not put too much store by the military option in terms of overwhelming the opponent. But yes, I do believe that it is an important option to keep it on its toes, to keep guessing, to have fear, and to realize that we will not hesitate in our retaliation. Let me end by saying that China appears to have done something which has gone relatively unnoticed in India as far as the military scheme is concerned. And that is to uh, uh, unleash a drone armory. I have the names here, uh, several, uh, you know, strike UAVs, ground attack, reconnaissance, precision strike ones, electronic warfare, warfare UAVs, all kinds of drone armory. I think it's time we took note of it. I think these are not rocket science. Of course, we should be self-dependent, self-manufacturing uh, and self-dependent on this. But for the time being, it can easily be enhanced and reinforced in our armory.
they seem to be working well for china and especially the inhospitable terrain we are talking about the importance of drone warfare and armory cannot and should not be underestimated that's my wish list for the military option let's now turn to the much maligned and the ones i pulled legs on the diplomatic option the option as they said of handling a porcupine without disturbing the quills one of the other definitions of diplomacy or acting in a way the art of letting someone else have your way well firstly under the diplomatic head i think it is frequently underestimated it is not dramatic it is not flamboyant it is not um, uh, immediate in terms of results but its importance its effect should never be underestimated secondly in the diplomatic head i believe that the power to name and shame is again under under understood underestimated naming and shaming across the globe bilateral meets international meets trilateral meets multilateral meets is a vital uh, tool in your armory and i would expect india to unleash a blitzkrieg and in its blitzkrieg it should not hesitate to name and shame for this event i think diplomacy permits it it's a fact see for example the way pompo uh, mr P uh, mike pompe speaks the forthrightness i don't say i'm agreeing with a lot of what he says i also know that when his master completes the election this way or that way much of this ardor will wane but i'm just saying the forthrightness with which a issue is taken up by mike pompe i think it's a lesson in our diplomacy blitzkrieg which is still i think not reached the stage of a blitzkrieg it must be given a greater push and we must leverage exploit the current anti china wave fortunately uh, sweeping the whole globe i don't think i have seen ever any such time with this degree in a kind of a consistent uniform manner and i think india needs to leverage and exploit that i think we also need and it's a very interesting article by a former admiral just a few days ago to focus uh, on all these things which you know about the four five major names are the asean extension which you call the east asia summit now because you are trying to add india australia and russia to it to the asean so when i say asean i mean that not the core asean then the quad the four country combination then you have the malabar which is the annual naval exercise alternatively in the indian and pacific oceans and then you have the Uh, uh, democracy 10 which is basically g7 with some additions now these are regional partial multilateral groupings which have <laughs> today and are of great use in the china equation but i want to make the point which arun prakash the former admiral has made i think to the extent that it we have some asymmetry militarily with china on the land and the traditional defense forces that is manpower machines land based or even air based i think that asymmetry is much less on our ocean and water frontiers and for many of these the joint exercises the patrolling the policing the up and downs in the pacifics and the indian ocean areas and several other things which you all know about that asymmetry converts into a naval equality or superiority for india when we combine with these entities so these words i use quad asean malabar etc uh, all have resonance also from the point of view of the ocean where i think china is more vulnerable and also is more adventurous and needs to be controlled on the quad i am disappointed that a former australian prime minister to use a crude non diplomatic word ditched us Kevin Rudd I think Quad is a very very important formation and I am glad that after his departure this was way back in 2008 and 10 uh we are now reformulating and reconfiguring and I think it should be made into a consistency Australia's zigzags have to be ironed out with us and with US and with Japan but 
the quad has lost some years from the Kevin Rudd time of 2008 when he partly jettisoned us to kind of uh, ingratiate himself with China. Uh, so I think we have the right move there to kind of reintegrate that. Uh, we also have to, in the diplomatic head, which I'm on, uh, use the two T's fully, the Tibet and the Taiwan T's. Leveraging, exploiting, much, much more so than we are doing. Now, Tibet, the glory and the divinity of the Dalai Lama is underestimated even today in Tibet. I think we have to pull out all the stops in giving the Dalai Lama his rightful place. Now, take for example the restrictions put on the Dalai Lama. Or for that matter, on visitors. And we have a Uyghur, Uyghur community guest here and we know what happened to Dolkan Iza's visa. My point is that the government of India today in the climate we are, can have a simple rule. No violent or insurrectionary activities against China will be permitted here. But short of that, political statements, declarations, seminars, visits, meetings, not of government, but of organizations. I give you just three examples. Richard Gere, I forgot to add, one of the most uh, iconic figures of Bollywood, uh, Hollywood. His visits, Dolkaniza's visit. Now, we are not concerned about Dolkaniza, what he does and says, as long as he does not do violent activities on Indian soil. But if he has a view, a democratic view about the Uyghur community in East Turkestan or Xinjiang, then I don't understand, especially in the current context, the continuance of artificial restrictions that you can come or you cannot come. You cannot get a visa or you can get a visa. If you come, you can speak this much and not that much. I think these are niceties which China itself has blown to smithereens. When China opposes you for that Pakistan-based terrorist, when China opposes you for the nuclear supply thing, and when China does what it has done now, I think it will have no face to re-insist on these niceties. And we will be within our international law rights saying that we are not permitting anti-China activities. We are the world's largest democracy. We are not like China. And we are allowing a unrestricted use of force, free speech within the parameters of our constitution. 191A in our country has to be available to speakers here so long as they don't do the exceptions or the reasonable restrictions put on 191A rights. Um, so I think the boundary line, the red flag, has to be nothing covert or overt which is violent or anti-China, but speech itself of an exercise of platform, democratic platforms to bring grievances to right cannot fall in that category. That recalibration we must do. As far as Taiwan is concerned, I think we must unhesitatingly elevate and enhance to full diplomatic status. Uh, by the way, Taiwan manufactures a lot of things we get from China. And I'm happy to note that we have increased our trade from 66 million US dollars to 6 billion, as in B, with Taiwan. Today, the big names you find coming here, for example, the biggest subcontractors of Apple who are coming, are all coming from Taiwan. And they're all Taiwanese companies, Foxconn, Winstron, Pegatron. I've got three names, there must be many more. And ultimately, uh, our shyness Kuwait Taiwan must also end because we are not permitting Taiwan to do anything militarily or otherwise physically against China. But certainly, we need today to send these messages. And you are underestimating the power of these multiple messages when done consistently over years. The synergy is much, much more than we tend to think of. Friends, then I think our criticism has to be more vocal, more diverse and more comprehensive. It has to be more vocal, vocal in the sense of the Belt Road Initiative. China has now unleashed a plan of Made in China by 2025. They've unleashed a plan of uh, China standards in 2035. We have resisted some of this, but we must be more vocal about our resistance, which is happening, but still not sufficiently. Pointing out why these are colonial imperialistic designs 
couched in economic assistance in another way. I must put a note of caution here. I don't agree at all with what we have done with our Russia relationship. It's our oldest all-weather ally. We must leverage the US relationship, especially till the Trump elections. But that cannot be at the cost of Russia. Let me tell you that Russia has the closest China relations perhaps ever in its last 30-40 years. It's a new development. It is even inching closer to Pakistan. These are two developments I'm horrified at. It is partly happening because while promoting our US relationships, we are not necessarily massaging our Russia relationship adequately. As I always say that just like Pakistan has a dragon in India's backyard to put some pressure on us, Kwe, Pakistan's protection. That dragon is, of course, China. India needs a dinosaur in China's backyard. And that dinosaur has to be Russia. There's no other country which can be in the dragon's backyard. I think this is an imbalance we must set right immediately. It's something which um, can cost us dear. I think Russia needs to be and can be reassured that when we have closer interaction with uh, 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 USA, it is nothing to do with Russia. And I think once we write this imbalance, the two emerging dangerous features I mentioned, closer proximity of Russia to China, and indeed much lesser so though, but closer proximity to Pakistan as well, is something we have to be aware of first and combat. Every small thing counts in the diplomatic bag. We have become the president of WHO recently, a little noticed fact. I don't see any hesitation in whatever way we can at the UN to use that presidency to look into corona issues with China, not necessarily to convict them, but to initiate. And that can and should go over the head even of a hesitant chief executive of WHO who has to follow the instructions ultimately if India has assumed the presidency. We are also under-exploiting other disgruntled countries, Kwe, China. I'm not talking of Australia and Japan, which comes under the Quad, but I'm certainly talking of Philippines, Indonesia and Vietnam. Vietnam, you'll be surprised to know, has had many skirmishes for a country of its size, many skirmishes already with China. They don't like China and they're a brave country. They had a 2014 standoff what is known as the Hai Yang Shui incident, oil rig incident. They've had Spratly Islands incidents. They've had several others. Philippines is another country that is constantly disturbed by Chinese incursion. And the Philippines, all again small countries, fought a brave arbitration against the Chinese on their so-called nine, uh, nine dash line in the, on the law of the sea issue. China refused to appear before the arbitral tribunal and they lost an award the tribunal held in particular i am quoting that china has no historical rights on the nine dash line map china of course has rejected the ruling but the point is that countries like philippines indonesia vietnam again this is apart from japan and china have to be leveraged much more than they are being as i said the uh, buddhist diplomacy is another way of needling, pricking and irritating China beyond their limits. Especially Kwe, one of the two T's, Tibet. Without dealing with Tibet, Buddhist diplomacy across the whole arc of Buddhism in Asia and East Asia creates a resonance which actually directly impinges on Tibet. And this extends from Southeast Asia to North Asia or East Asia onwards to Tibet. We are doing it in a small way intra-Indian tourism. That's not what I mean. I mean, as a part of our foreign policy, Buddhist diplomacy, to resonate the Tibet issue. That's a very indirect and effective way of doing it. Then, our friend, the Uyghurs, the Xinjiang area, and I'm sure we have experts here who will speak about it, but this 1949 occupation of the East Turkestan, I don't think India can directly be involved in it because we have our JNK problems in terms of being needled and hurt. I'm quite aware of that. But again, we have not been able to contain China in being 
against us on every forum or fora koi jain ke we have not been able to contain china in being brazen and egregious koi that terrorist who lives in pakistan and who cannot be declared as a terrorist so we have already not got anything from china in which case it's time as i said to promote visits by people like dalkanisa talks and functions by them parliamentary bodies or partly parliamentary and non parliamentary bodies like friends of ugers you have that for tibetans i was very intrigued to know that in june 19 2020 the european parliament created an inter parliamentary alliance on china and that's not based on parliament parliamentarians alone and they've expanded it to us germany uk japan australia canada sweden norway european parliament more than 100 mps mo, mo, the biggest focus of this inter parliamentary alliance is china's unacceptable expansionist policies india should have some role in it should join or have some consultative status in it these are all steps which are within the law but they send a clear message a globally and more importantly directly to china and it's the multi pronged approach of this the holistic which makes a difference let me turn now to a very important area the third head economic now in economic uh we have taken steps which are pinching china i'll just divide by economic point into four five quick points one is we have to calibrate a thought out strategy to identify soft targets like chinese investments which can even be cancelled now don't have a blanket approach don't start wailing and lamenting china 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 and just anything chinese is attacked by you calibrate it focused soft targets now the moment you say that the objection is well there are bilateral investment treaties which are bits bits and you can be sued by china as a lawyer i've examined some of them let me assure you that as you know they have a triple test which i'll not go into in law for which a country whose investment is expropriated can claim huge damages and redress but all of them and i'm sure this will apply have a established derogation which protects india they all call it the essential security interest esi measure so that's why you have to calibrate and focus and where you can show that you are doing this cancellation or abrogation of investment for essential security interest measure the bits will hold in your favor because it gives a large discretionary zone to the country invoking esi and there are several areas one of them are the apps where there is a security issue but many more where this should be looked at import substitution is important it's not easy with china let's not kid ourselves but uh, again you have to micro look as i said take care of the small things thomas hardy big things will take care of themselves don't have blanket approaches vivek debroy wrote a nice piece just i think one week ago or four days ago he said take for example uh, you know you cannot just abolish but take for example the classification now the classification has a two digit classification for some products and a four digit one and he gives a good example a two digit is toys comma games comma sports that is i'm talking of import substitution a four digit classification under that under toys for example says wheeled toys and then says tricycles scooters pedal cars and other wheeled toys now there's a vast difference by saying we stop all toys from china versus focusing on a four digit classification and asking the question which debroy asks and i quote him indian economy will presumably not collapse if wheeled toys that's the four digit level are not imported from china so there are lots and lots of things which are not going to collapse in india if you don't import from china but you need to go into the four level and the six level digit digitization at the micro level then again china's economy is based on an artificial booster it's the only country in the world perhaps where the cost of land is zero close to zero or very low land can be taken without asking you there are no land acquisition problems and it can be supplied free when they want some low charge when they want that's a huge benefit so there is a huge subsidy in everything chinese we cannot easily combat it but 
if that subsidy component in some products is 15% and it is so in some it is much higher which you can't combat but with 15% then if you can a do anti dumping up to that 15% level and then remove that anti dumping and go and buy 15% more expensive from a country which has an import substitute you are anyway putting anti dumping because you have to combat china slowly over time you can remove anti dumping and even if it is up to 10 to 15% more expensive elsewhere you can buy it this kind of calibrated approach is important uh selective boycotting is permissible it can happen should happen and the most ironical thing is china has itself done it it has repeatedly done it by itself and china uh does it by selective it did it against products from thailand from south korea etc from indonesia and i think we need to be clear about boycotting but again in a micro way so my point here is that judiciously crafted focused targeted mix of import substitution discriminatorily skewed tariffs steep anti dumping duties and of course apart from bans in some areas this can send another set of clear messages and let me assure you that these are not wto breach they don't fall foul i have written in my article recently which was published that there are judgments under wto australia canada salmon case of 2000 where if you are able to show that in sufficiently comparable situations the treatment was scientifically justifiable then it will be upheld there are judgments also in the argentina brazil case poultry anti dumping that it though it had been levying skewed levies it was not in violation of wto so we need to be little adventurous we have nothing to lose but our inhibitions and we have to examine them in a micro manner then lastly on the economy i think as i said the india china asymmetry arises from another different thing which we must leverage china's economic success is based on something which is uni single lateral unilateral which is export based it is only now becoming slowly domestic consumer demand based it's mainly export based india's economy is driven by consumer demand domestic and export base is a much smaller factor than china obviously the chinese and the indians attract each other like magnets if you can break the symmetry namely a big consumer demand here attracting the chinese export impetus if we can jam and repel this then you have achieved a very important achievement because china remains a heavily export dependent economy let me end now i possibly exceeded my time i'll end in about 2 or 3 minutes or 4 minutes by one factor which is not talked about which has been ignored but which i think is very important and this is my last point we'll take 3 or 4 minutes we've talked of military diplomatic economic foreign affairs etc etc we should not forget the personality driven ambiance of what is happening in china today we should not in one word forget the personality of z president z jinping under our nose without us even noticing it the following things have happened which even the press has largely ignored president z has become china's supreme unquestioned leader and many believe that he has cult status even exceeding that of mao and i'm choosing my words very clearly i'm not exaggerating vijay gokhale our foreign ambassador to china has written a nice piece on this recently and i'm taking some points from him to point out how it has happened in the last 8 years barely very short time he became general secretary in 2012 or so he has perched or sidelined almost all opponents in all spheres in china present and potential 
the policy which they call in china taking down tigers and flies that's quote unquote the chinese policy has purged hundreds of officials who were perceived to be close to the predecessors of president z two entities the security apparatus is very important there it is controlled by the people's armed police pap it's like the gestapo it is now directly under the command of president z and very importantly he is the commander in chief of the pla and he has removed generals like zhang yang and fang fengui who were the major icons of this army now remember even mao at the peak of his power although perhaps he could have done it did not make himself commander in chief of pla very few people know this the reserve forces of china are also under the direct command and this all happened in the last 7 8 years the uh, clause which prevented him from continuing as president beyond 2023 has been abrogated he can continue indefinitely you have put in one put in two put in three put in four reincarnated as president z i am sure after 2023 new guidelines on political life are replacing the guidelines of deng xiaoping who which were there in 1982 so 40 year old are replaced by president z's guidelines now <coughs> and in the universities of china the chinese dream is being taught which is compiled as the sayings or the elements of president z therefore i would say that remember president z is one of his rare interviews and i'll end on this and you must remember that this is the person you are dealing with at galwan at pangso this is your adversary unless you know your adversary the human flesh blood tissues you cannot formulate your policy he said in an interview he said if you want to become a general you must be able to win a battle we do not have battles every day especially in times of peace but only if there are battles does it give opportunity to show how you can succeed it's a remarkable statement and it gives you an idea why battles can be created initiated prolonged etc so unless you no also along with the military the diplomatic the economic and the multifarious foreign policy options you know the man who today china is not the problem communist party is the problem communist party is a lesser problem than president z so there are three entities out there and you must know how and when to deal with them thank you very much uh, thank you very much sir dr it was one of the most exciting uh, presentations that are heard on the subject i have been attending regular webinars till now and very comprehensive you covered all the aspects of uh, india's china policy and uh, how it needs a rethink and thank you for your recommendations uh, i hope this government listens to what you are saying and does the needful on that front i uh, now yes sir i now move on to the next speaker of the day uh, ilchat hasan kokbore he is the director of chinese affairs department of world vigor uh, congress and he is the ex president of uh, vigor american association he is a well known activist and defender of uh, human rights he is a writer and a political activist also analyst also uh, currently works uh, in the us in the information management profession uh, for the federal government to make a living uh, he is also he was a lecturer at the shinijai Shin college in Zilji, East Turkestan, uh, before he had to fl flee the country to seek asylum in U the U.S. So uh, it took him uh, almost three years before he could land uh, in the U.S. in 2006, July. Uh, he's a chi China expert and also a Chinese language expert. And he writes on in the Chinese language in several uh, publications around the world. And also an analyst uh, with several uh, television and uh, radio channels uh, in the U.S. I now request uh, Ilchet, a very close friend of mine, to please speak. Uh, the time is yours, Ilchet. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to pre representing the Uyghur community to uh, present our plights, our calls, uh, and also I heard a very comprehensive. Uh, policy analyze and also the Chinese uh, 
rationalization from doctors and uh, uh, I agree 100% with his uh, policy advice and etc. I also take away some. Uh, I remember in uh, 2014 uh, in India, the uh, Tibetan organized that human rights for ethnic dialogue. And the delegate initially was Dokunisa, our president, uh, me at the time, uh, president of Uyghur American Association and uh, executive chair Umar Khanat. But unfortunately, on the last, I was the only one made that trip. And even when I landed in the New Delhi, uh, and I was a little bit worried if I will be allowed or I will be sent back from here. Uh, but I'm lucky. I did visit and I attended the meeting and it was very great uh, experience. And I also feel I am back uh, almost like my hometown. When I saw that high mountain, it's, I had a lot of emotion. Uh, if I am crossing that, probably I can back to my country. And back to history, we know uh, China never was a uh, border, a neighbor with India whether it's in the Tibetan side or whether it's in the uh, East Turkestan side. And because of their expansionism, uh, their colonization, and uh, eventually becomes a uh, neighbor for the India. And uh, under their colonization, I was a, just like a host introduced me, I was a college uh, astrophysicist, teaching chemical to the Chinese student and teaching Chinese language to the Uyghur and the other minority and some student from Central Asia. And because of their uh, policy discrimination, open discrimination, and it pushed me step by step to against it. And in the end, I have to flee because someone told me the Chinese government tried to get rid of me. Uh, because of my outspoken. So I left and uh, end up in US. I continued my struggle. And uh, starting from 2012, the situation switching on the war side. In 2014, I just start from my personal story. My elder sister, because of my writing, because of I sent some money, because she is a single mother with two kids, and my elder sister in 2014, August, she was get arrested. And the police told my younger sister, only if your brother stops or he come back, we will release your sister. So no any other question? She is in unknown uh, place under the government's arrest. So since then, I lost my elder sister. After a few weeks, all my sister cut off the uh, communication with me. And in 2015, my father passed away uh, because of, uh, actually in the early, I ran away from my country, East Turkestan in 2003. And 2014, the police to retaliate and they, use the Chinese mob, they killed my brother, my younger brother. So in 2004, I lost my brother. Then 14, my sister was get arrested. 15, my father couldn't bear this trauma. He passed away in uh, April. And then in August, when I called my mother last, it was in 2015, my mother told me, Please, son, don't call us again. Don't call us again. Your own sister and their kids, they graduate, some of them graduated from university, but no job, no anything. They can't make a simple life because of you. We had enough. Starting today, don't call us, and God bless you. This is the last call.
After that, I lost contact with my mother. I'm sure she is 82 now. And today is, as a Muslim, it's our Eid as her. But I can't call her. I don't know if she is alive. I don't know if she is in concentration camp or jail. And my three sister, last year, uh, around uh, October, I got the news from Kazakhstan. From that end, one lady told me before she left in East Turkestan, she was in a concentration camp and she met my two sisters in that concentration camp. And when I asked her, what is the last time you saw her? She told me 2018, end of the October, last time she, she saw my two sisters with husband and the kids, total six in that concentration camp. So, like yesterday, I wrote a Chinese poem to put in the website. For me, no any eat, no any celebration, because when you cannot in this modern day, you cannot make a phone call. Tell your father, your mother, or your sister's brothers. Give them a greeting. How you can celebrate something. And now we know it's not only my story. It's all Uyghur story. More than 3 million Uyghur in concentration camp, or in jail, or in forced labor. It is a genocide. It is a genocide. It's not targeting only Uyghur. They are targeting Kazakh and Kyrgyz, Uzbek, all indigenous people living in East Turkestan. And this is within the uh, United, uh, United Nations passed uh, in 1948, passed the Prevention and Punishment of the Genocide Act. And within that act, it has five clauses defin defining what is called a genocide. Anyone look at that genocide definition will uh, come to the conclusion Uyghur is facing a genocide. But unfortunately, only the West, US, Europe, Australia, are speaking out. The Muslim world, the Turkish world, they're all silent. Turkish world sometimes have a little bit voice, like Turkey, periodically, or sometimes they speak out. Malaysia, sometimes. But others, like Central Asia, some country, is cooperate with the Chinese. And it's a Pakistan is the worst. Their prime minister, Imran Khan, when confronted by the journalists, do you know the Uyghur case? I don't know. I didn't hear it. And this is the Islamic world's reaction. So we want the world to stand up. Sometimes it seems like you are helping us the international world is helping Uyghur. But in the reality, if we can't confront the China, if we can't stop them, they will spread, they will expand, and they will create a conflict in the India's border. They will create chaos in Hong Kong. They will create a conflict in South China Sea. And we are and sometimes a lot of people saying China had one country, two system policy towards the Hong Kong. From my view, it was started this one country, two system. Actually, it was started from 1949. They set up first in the Mongolian autonomous region. What is called the autonomous region? They have the different system with the central government. That is called a region. 
It's one country, two system. And then they follow up, they set up Uyghur Autonomous Region in 1955, then Tibetan Autonomous Region, then Hui Autonomous Region, totally five autonomous regions set up in 1950s. But we never ever had any autonomous right. It's totally a colonization policy. And now we are witnessing and seeing every day how the Chinese promised to the world the one country, two system collapsed in Hong Kong. Just the, uh, before yesterday, they arrested five young students under the national security law, accusing these five uh, young guys as separatists undermining the, the state. And they are under 18, some of that five youngsters. And yesterday, they announced, pushed all the democratic election one year using the national security law as pretext and published uh, all candidates' uh, candidacy. They, they are not qualified from the democratic side. So the whole world, we are witnessing a giant not keeping their promise, very great, aggressive. Very great and aggressive. We need confronted. And we need, as Uyghur, we need help. India actually can do a lot, just like just now the doctor said. India can do a lot. First, can give us some platform, like today, like today, or inviting our organization or individual activists to give some presentation, to introduce the reality. Let Indian people, you, India, have a big Muslim population. Let them also hear how the Muslim, under the communist rule, how they are crying, how they were killed, and they were under a genocide. They technically say it's a genocide. And also, India as a democratic Asian country, we have a lot of similarity, cultural connections, and that if I go it's too much, it's very detailed. Uh, in the 1950s, the previous Uyghur exile from after the communist conquer, they ran away to Kashmir. And it was the Prime Minister Nehru went to Kashmir to meet with our leader, Isa Alptekin. So we have this connection, we have this cultural connection, historical connection. And we need to learn, as a, a activist uh, like me, like others, Dokunisa, our uh, organization, we need to learn the democracy, we need to learn how to run a big organization. India can teach us. India can have some stamina to train our people. This is a within the democracy, helping each other, and also, we have a lot of Uyghur refugees in the Central Asia, in the other place. India can give them a temporary shelter if it's not permanent. That is a big boost for the Uyghur community, and it will be give us a very strong support. And also, India, as in Asia, a big giant a democracy country in the Central Asia can have a big impact. I remember a few years back when Prime Minister Mr. Modi visited Kazakhstan in Nazarbayev, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev University. Mr. Modi 
recited when he gave a speech to university student, he recited a poem. It was written by a Uyghur, very famous and a brave Uyghur intellectual. At that time, I don't know in India if stirred anything, but in whole Uyghur community, we were so excited. A India prime minister recited in Kazakhstan a Uyghur poems poem. That was a hope. That was a encouragement. But it was uh, just stopped in that poem recitation, no follow up. And after that, when we tried to visit India uh, as a representative, like Dolkun was uh, not allowed. I mean, in the Muslim world, in the Central Asia, we hope India can play a very significant, very important role and to stand, speak for Uyghur. So this is also a leverage for India because you are exposing the reality, a truth. I don't think China can say something. China is now in whole in defense. We have that weapon. We can use it. Uh, one second, uh, if you could just uh, take one more minute to conclude your speech, yeah? please. Sure, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I was a little bit excited. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it was very impressive, this uh, conference. And I just want to thank you. Thank you all listening and also experts and uh, give us more support and give us more opportunity to present ourselves uh, also in media, in the conference, in the others, so we can have more uh, voice in the India. Thank you. Ilshad, thank you very much. You are a very personal friend of mine and uh, I know your personal story, so I can relate to what you're talking about. Uh, you know, we are we are with you. I can assure you that at least I am with you on this uh, aspect. So we our support this. I can assure you that. Uh, now I move Thank on you. to. Uh, I now I move on to the next speaker of the day, uh, and he's also a very eminent personality, Honorable uh, Mr. Ninong Ering. He's presently a member of the Legislative Assembly from Pasigat West Constituency in Arunachal Pradesh. He's known for innovative approach in governance in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, and a prominent voice for, from the opposition party. Uh, uh, Mr. Ering was a member of parliament from Arunachal East constituency in the 16th and the 15th Lok Sabha parliament in India. He also served as a union minister for minority affairs uh, of the, in the UPA2 government. Uh, 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 Ninong Ering has been a very vocal leader against Chinese issues, especially pertaining to Arunachal Pradesh. He has categorically resisted against the stapled visa issue raised voice against Chinese incursion into Arunachal Pradesh repeatedly and even accused uh, China of building dams and tunnels to harm Indian interest. Uh, he fought a very lonely battle uh, against China on blackening of river Siang, which created havoc in the uh, northeastern region. In the recent times, he has asked government of India to sue China and ask for a 22 US, uh, US dollars, 22 billion compensation from China due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I now request uh, Ninong Eringji to uh, make his remarks. Uh, Ninongji. Ninong Eringji, I've unmuted you. You can speak now, please. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Especially uh, Dr. Abhishek Singh, uh, we are meeting after such a long time. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, to this forum because uh, I have not much to say, especially when uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Singh Ji has, you know, in details explained uh, what are the policies we should take up. And I uh, fully agree with him. I totally agree with him in uh, which way. You know, we should the government uh, of uh, the 
the bjp government should uh, look forward and take forward the issues of uh, the you know of the uh, indo chinese you know uh, diplomatic reasons or in the defense reasons or in which way we can you know uh, take up the issue i am also after uh, the uh, speech of uh, uh, ishat uh, hussain uh, Bore, I'm really, you know, uh, touched uh, the way you have, you know, uh, expressed your feelings. Of course, we also have the same kind of feeling. Uh, that is why the reason is that, that uh, China is still claiming Arunachal Pradesh uh, as a South Tibet, a part of South Tibet. And that is the reason why we have always raised the voice. <clears throat> there is the case of the present MPs, Mr. Tapirgao or... Uh, Mr. Kiran Rizhu, the Union Minister, we have always fought together for this issue. And you'll see if you come to Arunachal Pradesh, our people always say, whenever we'll welcome somebody, we don't say good morning, good afternoon. Uh, we just say, uh, we don't say even namaste. We say Jai Hind. Jai Hind means we are part of India and uh, India we will stay. Uh, I would just like to, you know, just give us, uh, I won't take much time. Because most of the points <clears throat> have been covered by my senior uh, and my own party man, Dr. Abhishek Singhviji, in which uh, I think I will, you know, just put in some points with, in regard to Siam. Now, uh, I'll just give you, an, just like I was saying that uh, in 2016, long time back, uh, I had asked that uh, I would like to go to China. Uh, and the reply was that, no, you can't go to China because uh, uh, you need a staple visa. Then I said, that, no, okay, if at all, you know, if I am to uh, own a staple visa, then I will not go to China. Why should you go on a staple visa? And China's response was that uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, part of South Tibet, so you are, in, uh, you are a Chinese, so you must come uh, without, you know, any hesitation. So I said, no, this will not do. And uh, I said, I'm a true Indian. I'm a true, you know, Arunachali. And as Arunachal is part of the mainland India, we will not uh, participate in this. And most of my, you know, officers, pilots, uh, who were supposed to go on training, uh, my sports persons, <clears throat> they, they were all denied because they all wanted to give the staple visa, which we did not accept. Of course, some of the MPs, uh, they must have gone from Arunachal, so I heard they had gone to China through some other ways and means, uh, through you know some other countries they had to go. But uh, I said, no, uh, if, uh, if I am to go to China, I should go as an Indian, not as a you know, a part Chinese. Uh, if I have to, if I'm not, uh, if I'm denied the stipend visa, then it is better I take a bullet in the chest, but not on my back. So I have to, you know, that patriotism has to be there. I can't just say that, no, I will not, you know, uh, just just to see China. I can't uh, forsake my country my, or my people. So that issue I had taken up not only with uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Uh, I even uh, took up this issue when uh, uh, Mr. Jinping had come to Gujarat or when uh, he had, uh, in 2018, when there was a G20 summit, then also uh, in Argentina, then also I had written a letter to him that no, we should, uh, you know, uh, issue that why should Arunachal be, you know, denied the visa and instead we should go to China on a staple visa. So I said, no, this, this will not do. And that is the reason why, uh, you know, I had stuck to that and I'm still sticking to that, that no, we are part of India. We are integral part of India. We are true Indians. And I cannot go to China on a staple visa. Uh, you must have heard in the news that a few uh, last year um, in Tuting, this is uh, in my own, it was my constituency, uh, the Chinese troops had, uh, in, they had an incursion into Bising village. That is the last border in Tuting. So here, our people were very brave. Uh, they came out with uh, hammers and you know, the daos, and they chased away the Chinese uh, Chinese people who were constructing that road. In fact, they had uh, come over one kilometer into India because uh, we don't have a road there in Bising. And when our, 
army people also do not go there. It is just, you know, in the ALAC. Uh, the Chinese also don't come there. The Indians also don't, the Indian army also does not go there. But suddenly these uh, Chinese, they started making roads and came into Arunachal Pradesh, that is in India. So there was a very big hue and cry. I raised that issue. And of course, the Chinese uh, bulldozers and uh, vehicles were all, you know, uh, we had to destroy them. And uh, the people of that area were very brave. They said, Jai Hind, Jai Hind. And then, you know, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. And they uh, broke all the <clears throat> vehicles. And uh, the Indian army was called. And the Indian army went after a few days. Of course, very unfortunately. Uh, but now it is under control and that area is uh, now uh, under the uh, in indian indian jurisdiction now not only there but also uh, in the dibang valley the incursions have taken place and you know uh, i think uh, just uh, uh, last month a boy also was uh, kidnapped from uh, upper subansari and taken to china and of course uh, they released him in uh, uh, Bumla, and then he was again brought back to his uh, own uh, native village. But here you will see that the Chinese uh, have already started, you know, made dams there. They have already have powerhouses there. And in fact, uh, the, the Chinese, I think that the, my main, you know, objective or what I would like to express to the our government, not only to the UPO government, which I had always expressed, but also to this present uh, NDA government, that China, if we, it is a fact that we don't have any kind of a, a, a treaty on the water, you know, uh, on the Brahmaputra or other, you know, adjoining rivers which uh, have, which flow in from China. Like in Apan Subansuri, the Subansuri River also, where China is making dams in their side, is a very dangerous threat to all of us. Now, uh, you were just mentioning me in my case where I had uh, mentioned in about uh, uh, two, two years, uh, about, yeah, two or three years back when I was an MP member of parliament, when the whole Siang was blackened and all the you know, aquatic uh, fishes, the animals, uh, the turtles, the tortoise, Everything was destroyed. All the fishes died. And, you know, contamination was there. And then I had raised that objection that uh, uh, the Chinese were trying to dig a tunnel, a thousand kilometer tunnel to zigzag into the, uh, the desert area of uh, the uh, southeast uh, China. And uh, the whole Brahmaputra the diverted. So I had raised that ob objection. But of course, uh, the Chinese have uh, they had said that no, that there was no such uh, policy or there was no such you know uh, a, a, a scheme where we were to divert the rivers. But here I will tell you that how could the water turn so blackish or brackish and you know so much uh, polluted? So that was one reason I had said that no, uh, the Chinese government is uh, hiding things from us, and uh, because the concern of the Mm, Zangmu Dam also. The Zangmu Dam on the Brahmaputra is one of the largest dams. And uh, I had seen in a news report also that China is making a kind of, a, uh, you know, it is it can be used as a threat in the future because now you will see that uh, because of these dams, there, there are about four dams along this river of Brahmaputra. And suppose they release those dams all at once, it could be you know kind of a water bomb, and it could destroy the whole of Arunachal Pradesh, the downstreams, the whole of Assam, or it may even affect Bangladesh also. Like uh, in 2000, also they had released, uh, uh, you know, there was a dam due to an earthquake, and which had broken, and it, it was a lot of devastation had taken place. So now I will now, because uh, Siang River, that is the tributary of uh, Brahmaputra. And the main tribute of Brahmaputra, which uh, starts from Man Mansarovar, that flows the whole of the Tibet Plateau, enters into Arunachal Pradesh as Siam in Tuting area, and flows down into Assam and then on to uh, Bangladesh.
Now, this could be a kind of a, uh, a water bomb. And if we, you know, do not take precautions or we tell the government of India that uh, these, these all, you know, kind of agreements must be there, at least controlling the water, this thing. Because China is taking up, you know, issues with not only us, but with uh, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, the whole river, say like the Mekong River. The Mekong River, uh, it is known as uh, Langsang in China. Uh, you will see that now in Thailand also, they are the last large production of sugar is there. Now during the last year, year before last two, three years, uh, they are saying that uh, China says that no, there is no water. Uh, there is shortage of water and so that is why uh, we cannot, the river is not, uh, it is drying up. Or even in Vietnam, where they, the highest production of rice is in Vietnam, there also uh, the same issue has taken place. And then, uh, and when uh, through the satellite it was seen that all these dams that were in uh, China, they were all, you know, uh, completely flooded, they were with, with full stop, but they were trying to divert the rivers. That is the reason why I was also have that, you know, kind of a fear that suppose this river is diverted uh, into the Xinjiang province, where it is, you know, there is a desert there known as uh, uh, Takya Makan Desert, where they wanted to drive, divert this river. If this river is diverted, then it will surely affect the downstreams of uh, uh, Assam. Or even the Bangladesh, where you know the, the Brahmaputra River will completely dry up and they will completely driver, divert this river. So I had taken up this issue even in parliament uh, under 377. And of course, uh, the government has uh, replied, and especially from uh, uh, one of my very good friends were there, the minister. He had personally met me also, and he told me that nahi, aisa kuch nahi hai. Uh, China ne unka jawab de diya hai ki aisa koi humne dam ka ye tunnel ka koi humne proposal nahi diya. Like the Chinese guys, you know, we have to be very cautious. Like my senior has said, Singhi sahab, that uh, in a dipl diplomatic terms, we have to be very careful with them. You know, they can do anything. And uh, suppose, uh, uh, you know, because they do not give, they do not uh, give out the knowledge uh, even to the world what they're doing like in just in this pandemic also you know, the when wuhan that incident you know the pandemic started when this uh, coronavirus started and they kept it hidden of course i've written to the prime minister that china should be completely responsible and they should you know uh, be responsible for the destruction that has caused not only to india but throughout the whole world so this is a kind of uh, you know a third world war had taken place and china won the battle without even you know uh, uh, they won the war without even shooting one bullet. So this is a thing that uh, Chinese, you know, that mentality is there. They will even, you know, uh, dispose of their own people. They don't mind, like just uh, like Mr. Uh, uh, Kogborea just said, that, you know, they have no feelings. They don't have any sentiments. So that is why the, this has taken place. Of course, uh, like uh, my senior has just said, that uh, the Chinese apps were banned. 15 in apps were banned. And that time I had again written a letter to the Honorable Prime Minister and also to the External Affairs Minister that uh, there is a, a spy instrument, uh, there's a Chinese company which is known as Huai and which is, you know, going around, it is a big threat to the, uh, the privacy of the citizens. It is a tool of mass uh, surveillance and it's a, it's a Chinese multinational technology company which is, uh, you know, it was uh, founded in 1987 by uh, Ren Zing, uh, you know, former engineer in the Chinese army. So he he's already has that espionage. He already has that, you know, that uh, he has a system behind it. So this is going to be a big threat to India also. And I have written to the prime minister that this company also should be banned as the other, you know, 15 apps. Of course, like uh, Singh Sar has just said that uh, most of the... Uh, goods of china are being banned even i heard that even the televisions are to be banned uh, in india so this is a good you know kind of initiative by uh, this government of course i'm in the congress so naturally i'll say that their policies may be wrong but 
I think that uh, if, if it is in the interest of the country, the interest of the people of India, I think we should be all stand forward. We should stick together and say, okay, we should stop China. Now, now what, what action should we take? You know, uh, frankly speaking, when we speak about uh, the Galwan uh, incident, uh, and now also uh, they, they said that even in that uh, the fingers, you'll see that uh, they have already come over, taken over, and then they said that uh, the Chinese said, okay, then we are going to withdraw. But they are already, they have withdrawn, but they are already in the land where the Indian government, uh, the Indian, uh, you know, kind of uh, LAC was there. Now that has become part of China and this, this becomes that, you know, that uh, the land which was completely India uh, has now, you know, turned into a buffer zone. So these things, uh, you know, the government has to take uh, some initiatives. We have to be very firm. We have to be very strong. We cannot just, you know, uh, bow down to them. Now, when you see, if you remember the Sungrangsu Valley, now the Sungrangsu Valley in Tawang, in our own Arunachal Pradesh, now one fine morning, uh, the Indian army went back to the post and suddenly the they see the Chinese army, you know, playing volleyball there. And when the Chinese, uh, the Indian army said, this is our land, you have to go back. They said, no, this is our land, and you can see we have pitched the tents, and we are uh, uh, we, we are playing volleyball, and we are very much here. So that was in, in winter they came down. In summer, we go to that area, and there are pastures there also, and our local, you know, herdsmen, they go there, and they told the Indian army that the Chinese have already occupied. And that is how we lost Sungdong Chu Valley. So this is a valley which, uh, unfortunately, it is now under the Chinese occupation, which has been completely ours. Wow, outpost was there. So this is uh, one of the biggest, you know, kind of uh, drawbacks we have. Uh, in fact, my uh, friend... Long, my friend long, uh, just a second. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have uh, given time till 7.30, but it's already 7.30. I, I seek the permission of uh, Dr. Singhvi uh, to extend it by just 10-15 uh, minutes because we have one more speaker left. Uh, we'll uh, end it by 7.45, if you give permission, Dr. Singh. No, 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 no question of my permission. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. No, no I don't uh, mind. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, but frankly speaking, what I wanted to say is that uh, we, we have to use our influence. We have to use our, you know, uh, uh, good sense. And we have to, you know, uh, put a stop to the Chinese army or to... And it, there should be no repetition of that of Songbongsu Valley, or there should be no repetition of Galwan. We have to be more diplomatic. We have to, you know, if they say that, okay, uh, we are, you know, uh, we are uh, going to be have diplomatic relations and we are going to have a good, you know, friendship. Uh, we also want friendship. We don't want to have fight with China, but they have to be very clarified. We have to be specific that Arunachal is part of India. It's an integrated part of India. We, that stable visa system has to be stopped. The government of India has to take up this issue in whichever forum they are. And then, uh, uh, the, you know, the, under the, there was a special offer in 1960 and 80 where they said that, you know, that uh, the India recognizing Chinese or, or outside Chin in the Western uh, sector then they would uh, accept the MacMahon line. Now, on what grounds will they not accept the MacMahon line? The world is accepting MacMahon line. We are accepting MacMahon line. And that is the reason that uh, another Sungrungso Valley issue should not take place because already now here we have seen that uh, even in Upper Suman Street, they have already occupied. They've started uh, making those, you know, uh, dams. They've started having these powerhouses. Uh, my friend, Mr. Tapir Gau, the present MP of uh, the BJP, has raised that issue and that is why it became a you know very hot topic where the honorable prime minister said that no there is no incursion but his own mp uh, you know an mp from arunachal pradesh has said that there is an incursion if there is incursion in chaglaham there is incursion in kivito there is incursion in sungrunso there is incursion in upper Sumansi. so you know frankly speaking we should not just take but one thing like uh, Mr. dr singhvi said that regarding this buddhist issue when we say You'll see that Tawang is, you know, it is uh, the monastery is one of the oldest monasteries, which uh, I think that is the reason why China says that, uh, nay, uh, ye hamara, uh, this is our area because this is South Tibet, because uh, 
uh, that is the reason why the Chinese did not come because the Indian, uh, you know, this thing was there. The Indian uh, government was already there in Tawang. So in 1949, when the, that uh, uh, the, the His Holiness the Dalai Lama had to come come out from there from Tibet, uh, the, he had to come through Tawang, and that is why China is still claiming that uh, you know uh, our uh, the Tawang Monastery is part of South China, and we must, uh, you know, uh, Arunachal also is now in that. That is the reason why it is, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, it is part of us. So in 1959, when the Honor, his Holy Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, came out from there, and uh, he came to India and he settled there. And now, what I would like to, you know, think that because if the Chinese appoint after the his holiness the Dalai Lama is, you know, he hands over uh, a new Dalai Lama is uh, incarnated and it is from China, then there will be a lot of problems. So what I think that a Dalai Lama should, you know, uh, name his successor either from Tawang, from Namsai or from Bondila, that is in Arunachal Pradesh, and then we can have a say that yes, His Holiness is, you know, uh, the, the 15 Dalai Lama is from Arunachal Pradesh, and then uh, this will, you know, help us in, you know, containing China and like even today we say, um, um, my Honorable Chief Minister Sri Pema Khandu also says that it is not an Indo-China issue, it is an Indo-Tibet issue. We still honor Tibet, we still recognize Tibet. Arunachal Pradesh always has very good terms with Tibet, but we have nothing to do with China. So I will, uh, you know, uh, wind up here, but I would really like to thank you. And especially Dr. Singhvi, he has really elaboratedly, you know, give us a lot of knowledge, which even, you know, we have to learn from. Thank you. thank you so thank much. You. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Nirmal for your, uh, your know, talk on Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, I, I, I'm really indebted to both Dr. Singhvi and uh, Nirmal Garingji for uh, gracing this occasion. I now move on to Dr. Avinash Godbole ji, uh, uh, who is a professor in the Open Global University in Sonipat. Uh, he has always been a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, and also a research assistant of the uh, Institute of Defense, in, uh, Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Uh, he, he, he's a China expert, and uh, we are very keen on hearing uh, what he has to say. Uh, Godbhuji, please take about seven to ten minutes uh, uh, to finish your presentation. Thank you very much. The time is yours. All right. Uh, thank you. I hope I am audible enough. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, after those excellent talks by Dr. Singh, we and uh, Professor Hassan and uh, others. Uh, I have actually very little to add, but uh, I'll just speak a little from the perspective of the other side now. Uh, we have uh, China now as a power, uh, as a country which is more powerful, but it has also become more insecure. And we also have to remember that this is a year of the US elections. Uh, that is why the US-China rhetoric has become quite heated uh, and that is reflecting on China's behavior uh, quite extensively uh, outwards. Uh, you'll also have to recall that uh, the one fine moment when the American uh, aggression, uh, if I may use that word, uh, in dealing uh, with China recently changed when the casualty figure from COVID uh, in the US crossed the 100,000 uh, mark. Uh, and since then, the Trump administration has taken a quite provo uh, provocative uh, kind of positioning uh, on China. And surprisingly, they did not uh, do much on COVID uh, domestically before that. Uh, and surprisingly, they wasted a lot of uh, domestic opportunity also. Uh, so we have this situation uh, right now that uh, China is a powerful but uh, insecure country. And in the US election years, it is uh, going uh, all out. It is uh, starting to fight uh, with all the neighbors uh, and all the countries with whom it has had adversarial relations in the past. India. Obviously, we had the violent conflict uh, in more than 45 years, but it has uh, had repercussions from Taiwan onwards uh, to Australia, to Southeast Asia, and also uh, in the West, uh, for example. Uh, so that brings us to perception that for a long time, we all had believed that China was a status quo as power. It was acquiring power uh, one step at a time, uh, uh, and it had perhaps no intention of changing the world order. But has China changed its gear in the last two years under Xi Jinping? Has it become a revisionist power? And it, if the global assessment 
uh, seems to suggest that China has become a revisionist power. Whereas some of the people seem to suggest that China uh, is a corner country right now after the coronavirus emerged in Wuhan. Uh, and then it is trying to push back against the world uh, that is acting against it. But it is going a little too far uh, in acting against uh, the world uh, recently. Uh, and if you see that the Chinese tone about its position and its status in the world has also changed dramatically. Uh, right since uh, Xi Jinping's power, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, rise to power, uh, China had been uh, taking a proactive role in foreign policy, etc., uh, through the posturing like BRI, etc. Uh, even if you see the foreign policy white paper that China released last year uh, in September, uh, late September, it had given a kind of optimistic tone, but a lot of it has changed in the post-COVID era. The press conferences that you see, the two of them, uh, one by the premier and one by the foreign minister, they were quite uh, attacking uh, uh, by China in unprecedented manner. Uh, so it gives credence to the idea that uh, China's uh, understanding of its status uh, and of its power has changed. China has begun to believe that the world is beginning to act in a comprehensive manner against uh, China's rise. Uh, and technology is at the forefront of that war. Uh, the 5G, etc. have become the issues. Uh, incidentally, uh, okay, coming to the India-China relations and how uh, and the ways in which it can be managed. Dr. Singhvi mentioned four or five different groupings, uh, but surprisingly enough, a new grouping uh, has emerged through uh, debates and discussions in uh, memes. Uh, we know that recently memes and social media forwards uh, have become a way of communicating. Uh, and the meme war between China and Thailand uh, led to formation of uh, an informal formation of something called the Milk Tea Alliance. Uh, milk Tea Alliance versus the Green Tea of China. Uh, you know, we Indians also drink the milk tea, uh, which is our favorite form of tea. Uh, can we take that alliance, the idea of alliance forward uh, of the Milk Tea Alliance with the like-minded countries, uh, right uh, from India up to Southeast Asia, uh, and all of it combined who are facing the backlash uh, from China. Uh, that is one way of uh, looking at it. Uh, of course, in addition to the rest of the points that have been mentioned by the other speakers. Of course, I'm not repeating the rest of the points that were mentioned uh, by uh, the previous speakers. Uh, Professor Hassan's point that India is uh, giving more space uh, through to the uh, Uyghurs located elsewhere uh, through vocational training and uh, business opportunities is, a, is an excellent point. And I hope the government of India does take it forward. Uh, I also recall uh, at this point uh, one fine professor, uh, one fine professor, Professor Ilham Thoti, uh, whose status we don't know actually. I was following him quite closely, uh, and, uh, and then until the point he was uh, arrested and put behind bars uh, uh, for his poetry and for his work uh, on for liberal and uh, democratic principles of dealing with the minority question uh, in China. So India can do a lot without the government ha getting involved in the process, social uh, sector, academic institutions, uh, our economy uh, and our media can play a lot of role uh, in engaging these elements uh, for pushing China to behave in a rules-based order, something that India has been doing with like-minded countries for a long, long time. And Vietnam, etc., are excellent points because uh, we have been discussing for long uh, uh, with Vietnam our defense cooperation, including the possibility of uh, sale of a uh, major breakthrough technology like Brahmos. Uh, should the government uh, expedite that process? Uh, I think it's a time uh, that uh, the government takes a strategic position on that, including the training of uh, fighter pilots uh, and the naval cadet uh, in uh, our academies uh, of eminence in India and exchange visits. Uh, for interoperability, not just with the great powers, but also with the smaller countries uh, with whom we have a lot of shared uh, defense platforms. Uh, next is actually the, po is the point of strategic communication. Uh, that came up quite a lot. Uh, and in the last two months, especially since the 15th of June, we have had uh, comp not a comprehensive push positioning by government, but the, but the different ministries and the different elements talking in different voices at different points in time. That strategic communication is something uh, that we have to take keep in mind, uh, that we have to have a, a similarity of tone uh, at different locations. It sends a very strong messaging abroad uh, at the same time. Uh, lastly, India's dealing with China has been at the three levels, domestic level, uh, bilateral level, and global level. Uh, 
and the, the same goes with the strategic communication also these are the three agencies uh, locations where our strategic communications has to be better managed uh, at domestic level there is a very simple formula of uh, of truth uh, and it's unfortunate that india's economy did not really take off after the shock of 2008 uh, pooja mehra's book the lost decade is a fine uh, tribute to what has uh, happened in that 2008 uh, 2018 including the slowdown including the elections uh, including the demonetization cri- crisis uh, when we can mention uh, that right now uh, i recently heard a statement somewhere and it has stayed in my mind that the best foreign policy is 10% economic growth uh, and if india can ensure that in- including uh, inclusive economic growth of minorities of the uh, pro- people and provinces out of the growth channel uh, and women getting included more and more in formal economy that's the best foreign policy solution that we have getting india ready for new information technology based economy is something that we have to do bilaterally with china of course uh, trade uh, restructuring uh, better understanding of uh, bilateral communication and globally of course we have been doing a lot uh, and lot more points will come uh, of course uh, there are more points to say but i think we can save some for the question and answer so thank you very much for inviting me here uh thank you to uh, bull for uh, your comments uh, well added comments there uh, to what uh, dr singhvi uh, and others uh, have spoken today uh, in fact we have already crossed the time that we had fixed for ourselves uh, so there is really no time for question and answer session today but i think the entire gamut of issues uh, that need to be covered have been covered uh, among the four of you if uh, if uh, dr singhvi allows me i'll just ask one question uh, to him and then we'll conclude the session certainly certainly yes so uh, sir i just wanted to understand from you uh, you had proposed this uh, you know uh, you know three four pronged uh, approach as far as china is concerned that we need to deal with but there will certainly be a reaction from china when this sort of an action happens from the indian side so what do you think could be those challenges that india could face and how do we deal with that challenge of a reactionary china uh, See, on this aspect you are, you are absolutely right a proper strategic planning requires you to first wait for one or two months while you plan in depth in integrity and that plan includes the retaliatory reactions of china and your rejoinder actions that's part of the plan one two a lot of what i'm saying is irritating pin pricking embarrassing naming shaming identifying exposing leveraging without directly attacking china 90% of what i have said is that kind of stuff uh number 3 quite frankly if you do things like taiwan recognition increase of trade allowing the uyghurs or the uh, tibetans to speak more china will make lot of protests but it doesn't get them anywhere and after a while it dies out and it establishes a new normal the world will be on your side because you are equally making it clear that if anybody comes here and starts proposing war against china or does something physical in terms of planning sabotage etc then india government is not allowing it but why should we be inhibited short of that uh, so i think all these send a message it's the clear text without violating it's like saying that you do everything short of actually committing any crime now i have a problem the problem is kashmir uh but i looked at the question a little carefully and i don't think china has given a millimeter to us in the last 70 years on kashmir i mean it's not that we have a trade off there whether you take the axis chain the northwestern frontier the domestic affairs the connecting road to china the uh, uh, this fellow this uh, terrorism chap in un the naming the designation nothing now if that be so actually speaking you are losing nothing on the contrary a lot of the proposed actions by me may lead china will be surprised to find to backtrack on some of these softer issues for example they can easily dispense with and designate that fellow as a terrorist he hardly matters to them he is a dispensable piece of uh, you know a person as far as china is concerned or uh, reduce their opposition on our nuclear uh, you know advancements so these are 
real politic things and I have thought about it carefully. None of what I've said really directly infringes. We See, I, I was careful in saying, although I sympathize tremendously with the yoga problem and I was, you know, I've heard these stories before and I was very sad and uh, yet real to hear the story of Mr. Hassan. Uh, but I'm not suggesting that Ch India goes out and recognizes even Tibet, much less uh, Xiangxing, I mean, uh, East Turkestan. India cannot go and say that East Turkestan is an independent country. I don't agree with that. India cannot even say perhaps at this stage that Tibet is an independent country. But you are providing platforms, supports, indirect, a huge platform from a democracy. Because, you know, that would be creating a problem for our territorial integrity. China would then retaliate in uh, uh, Arunachal Pradesh in many different ways. But we don't need to do that. To help the Uyghurs, you don't have to go and say we recognize Uyghur as an independent country. To help the, uh, the, 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 the Tibetans, you don't have to say that you recognize Tibet as an independent country. That stage is all far gone. But it creates a huge difference when you have a Dulkan Isa or a Richard Gere coming and speaking here. And not once, but twice, five times a year. And highlighting a problem. That's the point. And sir, there's one more question that comes to mind as you were uh, speaking. Uh, in fact, uh, what, do you, what is your opinion on uh, you know, uh, India having a one voice as far as its external uh, you know, affairs is concerned, particularly with regard to China? Uh, because uh, you know, it is important that India presents a very single uh, focused opinion and view on this matter without having much of a political difference. You can see the tone, tenor, content of my speech. Uh, I, I have. I don't think it can be less political in any manner than it was. Uh, secondly, I, I would be less than candid if I did not uh, confess that foreign policy had far greater convergence and unity for at least five to six decades. I mean, I'm not talking governments. There have been all color of governments in these five or six decades. But the convergence, the continuity and the stability of foreign policy was much more. Over the last decade or, you know, less than that, we have seen a more fractured approach within India. I don't agree with that. I think that fracture needs to be repaired very quickly. And in any case, you know, uh, hostilities on the border are also a great opportunity to generate that unity. But yes. equally, as I said, it is reciprocal. Trust deficit, suppression, distortion, concealment, not reaching out, not involving you, not having a participatory approach. These things also, so you can't clap with one hand. You have to clap with both hands. So I think this is a two-way street. And if you find some of these happening, you will immediately find a convergence. Yes, sir. So thank you very much. Uh, I am really indebted to all of you and uh, Dr. Singhvi for your time. And, uh, you know, I thank uh, Ering... Uh, Ninong uh, Eringji, uh, Ilchat uh, Kogbure, and uh, Vinash Godbule for your time and for all the wisdom that you shared with us today. I request uh, the uh, Law and Society Alliance General Secretary uh, Advocate Kumar Vaidinathan from Mumbai to propose a vote of thanks. And with that, we'll end the show. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You are. Yeah, uh, it was a great pleasure to hear you and uh, all your points, and especially the point that uh, China need to have a dinosaur in the in their backyard was something very really amazing which you shared with us, and you also nicely exploited the fault lines and how we can take advantage and grow further. Thank you so much, uh, Abhishek Sanjeevji, for your time. It was very enlightening, and uh, we found it very informative. Thank you so much. Uh, Sri Ninong Eringji, thank you so much for your time. And Ilshat Kokbareji, thank you very much. And Avinash Godbaleji, thank you so much. Due to shortage of time, I'm not uh, explaining more. It was a wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you to the participants. Over to you, Bipinji. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to every participant who joined us today. Uh, a variety of uh, participants, former military officers, uh, former ambassadors. We had advocates, we had doctors, we had uh, you know whole gamut of uh, the Indian society participating. 
i thank all of the participants also for this uh, thank you very much for all your time we end the show when the event uh, with this thank you very much i'll reach out to each one of you after this event thank you